The scripture this morning comes from Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Good morning. I am more powerful than the combined armies of the world. I've destroyed more men, women, and children than all the wars of all the nations combined. I massacre thousands of people every year. I'm more deadly than bullets. And I've wrecked more homes than the mightiest guns. I can destroy the mightiest of buildings and the best of homes. In the United States alone, I steal more than $5.5 billion each year. I spare no one. I find my victims among the rich and poor alike, the young, the old, the strong, the weak. Widows know me to their everlasting sorrow. I loom up in such proportions that I cast my shadow over every field of labor. I lurk in unseen places and do most my work silently. I am relentless, merciless, and cruel. I am everywhere. In the home, in schools, in factories, on the land, and on the sea. I bring sickness, degradation, intense and everlasting pain, and death. Yet few seek me out to destroy me. I crush, I maim, I devastate, I terrorize. I will give you nothing, and I will rob you of everything you have. You are warned against me, yet you heed me not. I am your worst enemy. I am alcohol. At this time of year and when we come in the holidays, sometimes we find ourselves allowing things into our homes that we typically wouldn't. We might soften ourselves a little bit in this time and allow some alcohol in our home. And this sermon is not directed at anyone in particular. It is not directed, but or really directed at all of you. I don't ever mean to, to step on people's toes or make their feet hurt. I want to touch your heart with my lessons. And I'll preach about alcohol and how terrible it is. This, not just me, but the Scriptures will prove what it is. And that it is a sin to consume alcohol other than for the medicinal purposes that it has. God has given it here for some medicinal purpose, but the, the terror and the horrors that come with alcohol. Many preachers won't preach on alcohol. And that would be a strict and direct about alcohol like how it is but I will. I've seen the terror that it has. I've seen the homes that it has destroyed. I've seen the death that it has caused. It is a terrible, terrible thing. And men will sometimes come back at a preacher for speaking strongly the truth on, on alcohol. I don't fear that. I know the truth. And that being said, this, this is not a politically correct sermon. This is a truthful sermon on the sin of alcohol. What kind of drug, though, you might ask, compares to alcohol? We all hear about heroin and cocaine and all these other drugs, but alcohol, yes, is a drug of its own. And what drug, and I want to ask, what compares to it? Many, many more people have utilized alcohol than, than other drugs that we hear about on the news every day, heroin, cocaine, crack, all these other drugs. But what about alcohol? What kind of drug compares to that? You know, 60% will report drinking in the last month in men within 60% of them. 23 of these report binge drinking five times per month on average. Binge drinking. And binge drinking would be where you allow your blood alcohol content to reach the illegal limit of .08, which is typically four drinks for a female or five drinks for a man. That would be what binge drinking is. And out of the 60% of men who report every month to have drank, 23 will report to binge drinking. And then there's heavy drinking on top of that. In the U.S. alone, 85.6 of people, 18 or older, reported that they drank alcohol at some point in their lifetime, and 69.5 reported that they drank in the past month. And I won't lie to you, your preacher here was not always a Christian and did not always have this view on alcohol. I sadly was part of this 85.6%, but I have repented of that. I've read what the Scriptures had to say about alcohol, and I've seen firsthand the terrors that it causes. And I don't touch it. Alcohol is evil. 
In the U.S., 25.8% of people ages 18 or older reported that they engaged in binge drinking in the past month. That's 18, ages 18. Where are they getting that alcohol from? Who is supplying that, allowing that into the homes? 6.3% reported that they have engaged in heavy alcohol use in the past month. These facts, we can conclude that one of the most used drugs in the U.S. and in the world is alcohol. One of the most. And alcohol, it is a drug. It's actually labeled a depressant, meaning that it slows down vital functions resulting in slurred speech, unsteady movement, disturbed perceptions, and inability to react quickly. As for how it affects the mind, it is best understood as a drug that reduces a person's ability to think rationally and distorts judgment. That's what alcohol does. And alcohol, not only is it a a drug, but alcohol harms. Alcohol is a a big harm. And Christians, we're not exempt from being harmed from alcohol. Alcohol is responsible for over 30% of all highway fatalities. And I'll tell you, I have seen many die on the highway from alcohol. And now since I'm not employed as, as a trooper anymore, I can go in a little more detail than I have in times past about these events. I remember one night in Wayne County on Route 75 how in one night alone I told two wives that their husband would never come home again and that they are now widows because their husband chose to drink and drive. How one actually in his intoxicated state crashed into an alcohol truck head on, killing himself. And how the other, traveling at such a high rate of speed, crashed through a telephone pole and ended up splitting a tree in half and inserting the telephone pole down the middle of this huge tree. Sadly, it was hard to tell how many people were in the vehicle. Our bodies, we might think they're tough, but whenever you compare it to the wreckage of steel and, and carnage that a high-speed wreck has, we, your body's not that tough. It cannot withstand that. Alcohol is responsible for over 30% of all highway fatalities. Lucky that evening they didn't crash into somebody else and harming an innocent party on the roads. 300,000 incidents a day of driving under the influence. 95,000 people die each year due to alcohol-related causes. Since the last time I preached this sermon here several years ago, 95,000 people died. That has gone up by almost 10,000. I wonder what the pandemic has done with alcohol, what the numbers will be in 2020. These are numbers of 2019. More than 10% of U.S. children live with a parent with alcohol problems, according to a 2012 study. That, that means alcohol problems within their home. And how that, those problems will rub off on them. And how they'll be scarred the rest of their days. Parents, show your, fa- your children and the rest of your family the dangers of alcohol. And be that example to them that you will not consume it. You will not allow it in your homes. Not trick them. Don't, let, don't, let, don't be tricked. What about the past thoughts of alcohol? You know, we now say that it's okay to consume alcohol. It's wrong for a preacher to stand before a group of people and say that it's a sin to do something that you want to do. Like I said, not a politically correct, but even our government back a long time ago thought that it was wrong. Our U.S., our Supreme Court said this, We cannot shut out of view the fact, with the knowledge of all, that the public health and public morals and public safety may be endangered by the general use of intoxicating drinks nor the fact established by statistics accessible to everyone that the idleness disorder, pamperism, and the crime existing in the country are in some degree at least traceable to this evil. Oh, how at one time our own court systems even wanted to get rid of evil. Our Supreme Court back in 1917 even said how bad alcohol is. Abraham Lincoln, one of our presidents, who rumored to be a member of the church, He said that alcohol has many defenders, but no defense. And many will stand toe-to-toe with somebody and say alcohol is okay because it's the sacred cow. It's, It's a large amount of revenue comes from alcohol. It is everywhere. People will buy it up. They'll spend their last dollar on it. Alcohol is terrible. But my prayer is at the end of this sermon, everyone will recognize the evils of alcohol and will understand any use other than for medicinal is a sin. And a Christian should practice complete abstinence from alcohol. That's my prayer and it's my hope. 
that you all will see the evils just as I see it and as the scriptures will also reveal it to be. And as that, enough with the statistics, enough with the courts, but let's turn to our Bibles, to Proverbs chapter 23, and let's discuss some of the evils of alcohol, what the Bible has to say about it. In Proverbs 23, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red. When it sparkles in the cup. When it swirls around smoothly. At the last it bites like a serpent. And stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. And your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea. Or like one who lies at the top of the mast saying, They have struck me, but I, have, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? Proverbs chapter 23. Let's pull briefly ten points from this group of scriptures. In verse 29 it says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Sorrow. Sorrow. Alcohol gives permission for people to lie. Alcohol gives people permission to violate their marriage vows. Alcohol gives permission for a husband to smack his wife. I can't tell you how many calls I've went on domestic violence between households and the husband being drunk again beat his wife. Or even vice versa. I can't tell you how many times I've gone and the woman has beat the husband. We joke about that, but it's true. And she can whip up on them good sometimes. But always alcohol is there. I can't tell you also how many times every single overdose death that I've went to, though heroin will be what is wrote down on the death certificate, alcohol was there. Every one. Every murder that I've taken part in investigating, alcohol was there. It is always there. It is evil. We disguise it and hide it away, but it is there. Contentions in verse 29 contentions, heated disagreements, arguing. Things are said that normally you would never say. In these holiday seasons, well, we'll have holiday parties and with businesses will come, again, come around and we'll have the, the yearly festivities and the business will invite people over and you'll drink and then, and then you'll see over there that, that secretary that your boss is always fond of and always gives her the, the days off that she wants and he's always better to her, lets her have extended breaks and not you. Well, now's the time you want to say something about it. Now's the time when you want to approach him. When you're not thinking straight, then you'll say things that you wish you never said. And you'll wish that you could take them back. All because of alcohol gave you the permission to do it. Contentions. In verse 29, complaints or babblings is what it says. Who has complaints? Complaints. Babbling. Talk, talk, talk. Talk, talk, talk. Some, some whenever they would they drink, they just carry on and talk and talk and talk and can't stop and can't be quiet. They just want to carry on and keep on talking. Just babble and babble and complain. You know, one of these babblers said, one, one said, I drink mixed drinks with vodka so no one can smell it. That way he can disguise that he's drinking alcohol. Well, he was told to drink something else so that it was known he was drunk. And not just stupid. Wounds without cause in verse 29. Alcohol kills. Alcohol kills. Wounds without cause. That one fatality that I, I come into my mind about whenever I sadly told his wife that he wasn't coming home and she just cried. She just cried. I, I, I just tried to hug her. One of the hardest things you'll ever do as a trooper is Deliver a death notification. Especially something as tragic as that. His kids were playing in the yard when I got there. He only died a mile from their house. Wounds without cause. Alcohol kills. Redness of eyes in verse 29. Mental anguish. A hangover, a headache, and sickness. Verse 23 says diminished health. It, it's, it's a poison. At, at least it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. He says it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. It is poison. Hence the name intoxicated. Intoxicating drink. It's in its name. Toxic. Immorality in verse 33. Your eyes will see strange things. 
and your heart will utter perverse things. Immorality, perverse things, sexual things. How many marriages have been torn apart due to alcohol? In verse 34, yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like one who lies at the top of the mast. Instability. You can't walk. You know, what if, what if you had a video of yourself? Would you be proud to see how you, how you can't maneuver while intoxicated with this poison? Insensibility. Knocked down, unconscious, and passed out in verse 35. They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. An addiction. Verse 35. When I shall wake, I may seek another drink. Addicts, they hate their addiction. They really do. They get trapped by it. It's deceiving. It feels good, oh, for just a season, but then the truth really comes out and, and it has them. It has their snare and they're trapped by this. The devil will try to deceive you and, and try to make you think that evil is good. But God is not to be deceived. In Galatians 6 and 7 it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Don't be deceived about the terrors of alcohol. Scriptures do condemn it. Scriptures do condemn it. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards. Drunkards. Nor ravelers or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed. But you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I, I won't say that I'm any better than anyone. I said earlier that I did not always have this view. I did not always, I've always been a Christian, but I have been washed. See, as such were some of you, but you were washed. And I'm grateful for the salvation and the repentance that I've had and that my sins have been washed away and I'm a Christian. And I know the truth on alcohol and I'll preach the truth on it. But notice this, how drunkards is in, in mixed with all this evil. Drunkards is also mixed with all that. And we, we know how also in Peter, how he condemns drinking parties. And how that being sinful. We'll get into more of a drinking parties. Be wise and don't be deceived. Our, our scripture reading, wine is a mocker. And strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Or whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. In your King James. How does the devil commonly deceive us about alcohol in many things? I believe it's by twisting of the Scriptures. He'll twist the Scriptures and try to confuse people. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. In 1 Corinthians 14 and 33, God, God gives us the truth in His Scriptures. 2 Timothy 3 and 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Proverbs 23 tells us how terrible wine is and alcohol and, and beer and all intoxicating beverages. But then we get to Ephesians 5.18. And this was a verse that I always used to thought gave me permission that I could consume the alcohol as long as I didn't get drunk. The scripture reads, And be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Well, I ask you the, a fault of that. Is, is, it, is, it, I ask, is it a Christian's way to toe the line of sin? If that right there is sin, and if I pass it, I've sinned. Is it a Christian's mannerism to toe that line? I'm not sinning, but I'm close, but I'm not sinning. That's even against how we would do it. So when I ask you, is it, if this verse is giving you permission to drink, but just not in excess, you would have to at one point discover that point of sin, wouldn't you? How many drinks is too much for you And when it's a sin? Is it one? Is it two? And that's man's logic with it. So how do you find that sinful limit? You know, meduthko is the Greek, and it says not drunk. Be not drunk with wine is the Greek for meduthko. And meduthko means to begin to soften, and it's act, the act of drinking. Just the act of drinking is not drunk. So do not begin the act. And it does. Your first drop of alcohol begins to soften you. That's, that's how we're able to do the roadside impairment test. I've done so many of those that I can look at your eyes and I can tell you what your BAC is just by running the field sobriety test. That's how accurate and how easy it is. I, I would, it was often a game with us troops that we would, we would do it and we would guess what their BAC was. And then when they would go to the box and blow on it, 
We'd see how close they were. And I promise you, I was always within one or two points of their BAC. The minute you'd take your first drop, it's like it's science. We have to prove it in court. You see how it begins to soften you. And it's unique how medusco, to soften you, is used in Scripture. The very act of consuming alcohol for the wrong purpose, other than for medicinal purposes, is sin. Do not drink. Do not drunk. Do not medusco. Do not soften. Do not begin. So this verse communicates the act of beginning to drink alcohol is ungodly. Excess, wherein is excess? Excess in the Greek means ungodly. Do not, not drunk with wine, whereas is, is ungodly. That's what excess is. And a Christian, anything that is viewed ungodly, we should label as excessive. That we wouldn't want to do that. We don't toe the line of sin. Well, it doesn't say, thou shalt not consume alcohol. Give me the scripture where that says, thou shalt not consume alcohol. We'll give you all the logic here, and, and you'll see about how the Bible condemns it. We don't have a verse that says, thou shalt not consume alcohol. But it probably, if, if we did, it'd be right next to the scripture that says, thou shalt not shoot up heroin. Thou shalt not snort cocaine. It'd be right next to that verse, probably. Where do we have that scripture at? But we know that is wrong. We know that is excess. So sometimes it can be confusing in the Bible, but, but the scriptures are there. And if you study them, you'll see its use, its use in wine is, is different in how it uses its wine. And you've got you to look in its context of how that word is used. In our Hebrew, in the Hebrew, there's different uses for the words wine. You've got to look at its context. Let me give you an example of context and how we have to look and how it's used is when we say, I'm going to go get a drink. And if I told you, I'm going to go get a drink, now since we're talking about this, you'd probably assume alcohol. But other than this lesson, I said, I'm going to go have a drink. You'd think I was going to get a drink of water. Now, if I said, I'm going to go get a drink at the bar, and in its context, you'd know exactly what type of drink I'm going to go get. Or if I said, I'm going to go get a drink at McDonald's, you'd know exactly what I'm going to go get. A sweet tea, most likely. So, you've got to look at its context. So the Hebrew words, let's learn some Hebrew while we're at it. A shakar, a Hebrew word. Almost always intoxicating drink. And it always condemns it, unless for medicinal purposes. Proverbs 31 and verse 6. Give strong drink to whom is perishing. Strong drink. Shakar. And wine to those who are bitter of heart. You give alcohol to the sick. Strong drink. You see the difference? And grape juice to the one that's in a heavy heart. A bitty heart. If you're having a hard time, grape juice. You'll become dependent. You'll become dependent on the alcohol if you self-medicate with it. You'll become dependent on it. And it, it, it can pile up on you. The evils of alcohol. Strong drink to him who is perishing for medicinal purposes, and wine to those who are bitter of heart. And heavy of heart, I believe your King James says. In Proverbs 31, five and, 4 and 5, It is not for kings, O Lemel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for their princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the, all the afflicted. We see the, how bad it is to consume alcohol especially for kings, they'll forget the law. They'll do bad things. Tarash, we looked at Shakar. Tarash is never strong drink, and it's always used as grape juice. Tarash. Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, Isaiah 65 and 8. As the new wine is found in the cluster. It's not wine, it's not fermented, it's still in the grapes, you see. Tarash, it hasn't had the time to become wine. Tarash. And Yalyan. Yalyan can be used in both. It's used both ways. It can be both intoxicating or non, and it depends completely on its context and how it's used and able to tell. In Isaiah 16 and 10, it says, No treaders will tread out wine in the presses. So, of course, this refers to grape juice because it's not fermented yet. They're, they're treading the grapes in the presses. They're, they're making grape juice. Yalian, of course. And in verse Proverbs 20 and 1, it says, Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is, bra is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Wine is a mocker. And this is the alcohol use of the word yalian. Now, you often will have someone whenever they'll say, Jesus turned water into wine, so there's my permission to consume alcohol. Oinos is the Greek word for, for alcohol. If you would open your Bibles up to John chapter 2 and verse 1 through 11, let's discuss about Jesus in his first miracle whenever he turned the water into wine in John chapter 2, and we'll see whether or not Jesus turned water into grape juice or if he turned it into wine. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. 
Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now he's saying this tongue-in-cheek. Can you imagine Jesus saying this like this to his mama? He's saying this tongue-in-cheek. And also, if they, if they were drinking, if you go up to a woman and call her, Woman, and say this, there'd be a fight after that. That's just rude. You don't talk to a lady that way. And Jesus, knowing that this is just playing around, he says he's just tongue-in-cheek with his own mom. And see how his mom reacts whenever he says this comment to her. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. We know this is tongue-in-cheek and how Jesus, how Jesus was here. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And your King James Bible says firkins. is a different form of measurement. The New King James says it gives the measurement out, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water and had made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And they said to them, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now let's look at the evidences here that we have that proves that Jesus turned water into grape juice. One, it was up to 180 gallons is, is how much liquid he turned into grape juice. If he turned it into wine, it's like Jesus having a huge drinking party, which is condemned. Everyone, everyone says that drinking too much to the point of drunkenness is a sin. We know those scriptures, and that would be wrong. Would it be Christian of Jesus, or would it be proper of Jesus, a man without any sin, to have a large drinking party of 180 gallons of alcohol, a kegger, and invite his own mother to it? Absolutely not. Ridiculous to even say that Jesus would have done such a thing. And also you notice that the, the man, how he said that after they are well drunk, they bring the inferior wine. It's a party. They'll bring out the good grape juice, not the, not the one that's, that's going, going bad. They bring the good first. And after they're well drunk. Now if they're already well drunk and intoxicated, Jesus surely would not then make 180 gallons of alcohol to provide to them after they're already well drunk. Ridiculous to think that. Also notice that anyone who's ever consumed alcohol, you're impaired. We've gone over that. Intoxicating. Your taste, your sense of smell, everything is off. This man, after he is well drunk, tasted the water and was able to tell that it was the good wine, that it was good, that it was fresh, that it was a proper drink. This is not alcohol. This is grape juice. This is oinos. In its context, we see that it's a grape juice Jesus had made. So let us pretend to ask a few biblical characters as we, as we come to our conclusion in our lesson, a few biblical characters. We, if we were to ask Noah, if we could ask him about what he thought about alcohol, he would possibly say, I brought shame and embarrassment on my family. That's what Noah would most likely say if we had him here before us and we'd ask him. And Noah began to be a farmer. And he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment laid it on both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew that his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. He shall be to his brethren. If Noah wouldn't have consumed the alcohol and became drunk and consumed it, then this shame would not have been brought upon the family. Let's ask Lot what Lot would have to say about alcohol use. In Genesis 19 and 33, So they made their father drink wine at that night. And the firstborn went in to lay with her father. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. If you'd ask Lot what happened, he'd say something unthinkable. Something terrible happened. And also forced to drink, so they made their father drink wine that night. It was offered to him, and he drank it. And then that sin is what followed Lot. And Nabal, Nabal 
We know Nabal, whenever he had consumed alcohol, an embarrassment that he caused himself, says, Now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, and he was very drunk. And this was after Abigail, as she went to David and smoothed over some bad things that Nabal did, him being a harsh man, whenever David came and was bringing his soldiers along, he asked for, since David worked for, since they are trying to smooth it over, Abigail did, because Nabal being the hard man that he is, was getting ready to cost him a lot of, a lot of heartache with David. And Abigail had to go smooth it over because Nabal couldn't because he was a drunk. And so whenever she come back, told him he was very drunk. Therefore she told him nothing. Little or much until morning light. She's wise and knew it's not, it's not wise to even argue with a drunk. They teach us that at the academy. It's not just, just let them go. There's no sense in arguing with them. So it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal and his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him and he became like a stone. Ask him what happened. He'd say, I lost the respect of my wife and others had to take care of my responsibilities. What Nabal would say. King Belshazzar, whenever we studied not long ago about the writing on the wall, Daniel 5, 1 through 4, Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousands. While, it taste, while he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. Belshazzar dies that very night from his idolatry, worshiping the gods and silver. And I'm sure alcohol played a role in his poor decision-making of taking these items from the temple and drinking alcohol from them. Now, we've gone over how evil alcohol is, how terrible it is, and how the Scripture, how it speaks of its evils. Alcohol, does not, alcohol is not talked of, spoke of well in the Scriptures other than for medicinal purpose. It's never said good things about it other than for medicinal purpose. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 22. Abstain from every form of evil. After our study... I hope there is no question of the evils of alcohol. And I plead for us all to be of the same mind in this and that we and we be firm on this in our homes. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now I'd like to extend the invitation this morning. If you have not become a Christian and you need to become one, Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and remain faithful. I plead with you to become a Christian this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please come forward while we stand and while we sing.